there we go so yeah good evening welcome to norfolk developers uh we're joined this evening by roger priest uh to discuss the uh, web telescope uh, a little update from uh well the last time he joined us uh just a little bit from us first and then i'll get out of the way uh we do have a couple of exciting announcements this evening actually uh, but joining us, I believe, next Wednesday uh, is uh, Alex for Brewing a Serverless Application with AWS Infrastructure as a Code. Wow, that's a mouthful. Uh, he will be joining us on the Wednesday, Wednesday streams, 5.30 uh, for four, four Wednesdays. Um, as it says, building serverless applications with infrastructure as a code. Uh, it's on the meetup. It's on the YouTubes. Um, RSVP or hit the reminder button. Uh, hosted by you, we're always looking for new speakers and topics to whet the appetite. Uh, we're also at the moment seeking uh, conference speakers. Um, there's a call for papers going around at the moment. So that's what I bring right now. Uh, the Norfolk Developers Conference, we've moved it usually in February, but for obvious reasons, we're moving it to June. So it's June 16th and 17th, Thursday and Friday. Uh, join us for NordevCon. Uh, and exclusively there's a discount code at the bottom of this page that will only be live for a couple of hours so uh, grab it now the dash jwst all right a thank you now to a couple of sponsors um including one new one the exciting uh the user story as always sponsoring the discord uh, a massive thanks to them um if you need ux design or <laughs> user testing or research then give them a shout and this announce uh, an exciting announcement literally announced pretty much today i'm going to send out the tweets in a moment and the emails uh, tech educators uh, a boot camp east of england's premium tech boot camp um james is actually on the call i think but i will get him to join us uh, perhaps next next month uh, to actually give us a proper intro to uh, to the boot camp uh, he did give me a blurb as well, which I'm quickly going to find. Um, Bootcamp born out of the Excella incubator to provide a variety of tech skills to businesses and startups in the east of England. From the Mern stack to Web3 bootcamps, each course is led by a dedicated in uh, instructor even in one of Norwich's most modern office spaces. So yeah, check them out, techeducators.co.uk, fairly new to the area. So, yeah. Anyway, like I say... I'm going to get out of the way after a brief thank you to our patrons as well. They kept the lights on this year and they also got some free tickets. Um, so, yeah, maybe check that out. Anyway, like I say, we get out of the way and hand over swiftly to Roger to give us more on the James Webb Space tele tele uh, Telescope. <clears throat> OK, all mine. Okay. It's all yours. Hmm. Well, it would be all mine. Oh, hang on. I know. I know what I need to do. Hmm. Let me just, um, you know, it's funny. I did this and then, can you bear with me for a moment? Yeah, you're right. Never works when you want it to. No, the thing I'm supposed to be sharing is lurking somewhere in the background. <laughs> um, damn. Hmm. Uh, you know, if you're sharing and the app you're supposed to be sharing doesn't appear, but you've elected a number of other shares, how do you get, how do you switch off the sharing that you've that you've got at the moment? Okay. Right. Sorry about this. There it is. New share. Okay. Here we are. I'm not usually as technically deficient as this. <laughs> but what I'd just like to ask you is if you can see the share. Okay. Certainly can. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I would say OFT, operator finger trouble, but um, it's a poor excuse. 
So the question is, of course, uh, fortunately, we have quite a good story. Uh, we don't get a lot of good news stories at the moment. And before the telescope was launched, there were a lot of fears that it wouldn't be one um, because it's so complex. However, that has not been the case. So without further ado, I'm going to go into what um, we've been doing since. So here's an image of the telescope again, which you probably recognize from whenever it was I spoke to you before. Uh, and on the left-hand side, of course, is the launch rocket, which is an Ariane 5. Now, what I intend to do is split this into three uh, sections. The launch sequence itself, because how the launch sequence takes place and the graphics that were associated with it are extremely useful in understanding the, the how and why of how the telescope was launched. Secondly, the separation of the launch vehicle and the telescope. And then thirdly, what's been happening since, right up until I think sometime this morning. So, so just to recap a bit, the actual launch site itself. Um, the European Spaceport is at Kourou in French Guyana, 500 kilometers north of the equator. Now, technically, that gives the launch site some significant advantages in terms of because it's close to the equator, they can use less energy because that part because that part of the Earth is going around the fastest, uh, I can use slightly less energy in launching uh, rockets, uh, satellites, especially ones that are in fairly flat orbits. So it is an advantage for that. It's also on the Atlantic coast, so there's plenty of open sea uh, after the launch. And the other thing I just wanted to point out is that Kourou is not just where Ariane 5 is launched. There are two other vehicles currently being launched from there. There is Vega, which is the low cost European launcher. There is Soyuz, which is the only place where the Russian launch vehicle is launched apart from in Russia itself. And coming up next year, there will be Ariane 5's replacement, Ariane 6. So there's a lot, clearly a lot going on at the moment and a lot going on in future. The biggest problem at Kourou is the tropical weather at times. And as you'll see during the launch sequence, you don't get a particularly good view of the launch vehicle punching its way through the sky. So. Just to recap on the launch vehicle itself, which is an Ariane 5 ECA, which is constructed by Airbus. Um, this diagram on the right-hand side is a general representation of an Ariane 5. Typically, it would launch two heavy satellites at the same time. And here you can see two stacked one on top of the other, uh, enclosed in a fairing and the fairing is really important during the early stages of the launch. So it protects whatever is inside from the atmosphere. Immediately below that is, another, is uh, an interstage and that contains all the guidance systems. Immediately below that is the upper stage of the vehicle. And of course, below that is the main stage. In addition, there are two strap-on boosters you can see here. Now the engine for the main stage is a Vulcan 2, and this is an extremely reliable rocket engine. Uh, the upper stage is a hypergolic upper stage, and it burns liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. It's, I mean, all these components are critical, but the upper stage is particularly critical in the sense that it has a long burn. 
So it, the engine has to run for some 24 minutes to get the payload up into the correct orbit. So that's the Ariane. And now, Christmas Day, here's the launch. Atmospheric flight, so atmospheric flight, and the trajectory will be driven by a very, to, to reduce the aerodynamic loads, and then we will have a very different exo-atmospheric flight after that. And and you were watching uh, a number of people, uh, VIPs and invited guests moving out to the observation platform that is right next uh, to the Jupiter Control Center as we stand by for the one minute call from Jean-Luc Voyer. Attention pour moins une minute. Stop, à zéro moins une minute. Thumbs up from Jean-Luc Voyer. All systems are go. We're inside a minute now, T minus 50 seconds and counting. As you heard earlier, uh, the Vulcan 2 engine will ignite. Turbo pumps will come up to flight speed for seven seconds and the command will be issued to ignite the solid rocket boosters. The James Webb Te Space Telescope will be on its way. T minus 30 seconds and counting. Standing by for terminal count. A tous de DDO, attention pour les deux comptes finales. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, unité, top. And we have engine start. And lift off. Décollage. Décollage, liftoff from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Punching a hole through the clouds, 20 seconds into the flight. Good pitch program reported. Vehicle performance is nominal. The Ariane 5 rocket continues uh, to fly uphill in nominal fashion. The rumble of the powerful the Ariane 5 now being felt here in the control center. 3D animation. We can hear the noise and feel the vibrations here. You're right, Rob. Yeah, impressive. 13 kilometers in altitude, 7 kilometers downrange traveling uh, about uh, 0.6 kilometers per second. The trajectory reported to be nominal by Jean-Luc Voyer, the uh, range operations manager. You can see at the bottom of your screen, the yellow line is the trajectory plot perfectly overlaid over the green line, which was the pre-launch trajectory. Okay, so one of the useful things about following the launch, clearly the tropical skies didn't do the launch any favours in terms of visibility. Um, the panel that you saw at the bottom turned out to be extremely useful because all eyes were probably glued on the display of the um, anticipated uh, launch flight path or trajectory as against the actual one. And that is, of course, of critical importance. One minute, 41 seconds so, into the flight. Let's go Enough. on to what we have next. Um, I thought I'd include this because it, it certainly did the rounds of Twitter on the day in question. You see, the problem was after a couple of postponements, the launch was actually scheduled on Christmas Day. So there were a number of people who were very conflicted by this in the sense that they were supposed to be in their kitchens preparing a Christmas lunch or whatever, while at the same time anxiously keeping an eye on the launch sequence. And one of them was 
Dr. Becky Smethers. Now, Becky is, an, is a postgrad um, astrophysicist at the University of Oxford, and she runs a most entertaining Twitter feed as well. And there is a section on her Twitter feed of her in her kitchen trying to do two things at once. And in the middle of it all, she gets really, really involved in the launch. She's moving backwards and forwards, hyperventilating, and all the rest of it. The only thing I haven't been able to find out since this is what's happened to the Christmas lunch. But, you know, perhaps one day she'll tell us. But she, of course, wouldn't have been the only person with this kind of conflict of interest on a Christmas day. I mean, I do know of two of our members who had a conflict and they were out in a kitchen in a um, uh, kitchen shed observing the launch on a mobile device while they were supposed to be doing various vegetables inside. So each to their own, I guess. Now, the animation uh, really does help in terms of some of the captured shots. Now, this is at the point at which the main stage is separated from the upper stage, as you can see here. And you can also see two other things. The external boosters had already separated and the shroud that covered the James Webb and was a modified shroud uh, for aerodynamic reasons has been cast off. So the telescope is now fully exposed to the environment of space. So first stage drop off and you can see the second stage um, with the telescope mounted above it. So if we, if we go on to the next one, you can see here that the upper stage is ignited. Remember I said this is about a 24 minute burn. Now you might wonder at the accuracy of the graphic in that the whole assembly appears to be pointing slightly downwards when let's face it, it's supposed to be going into space. Uh, this is to gain velocity as quickly as possible. And what will happen a bit later is the the assembly will gradually come horizontal and then go into a steep climbing path, uh, again, to maxi maximize the efficiency of the launch sequence. So remember a long burn for this engine. And then we come to a short period where the upper stage engine has stopped firing, so about 24 minutes and the telescope is still attached. And the reason the telescope is still attached is there's an operation called lobstering. And what that involves is rotating the telescope slightly off angle from, place, from position to position. And the reason for that is to distribute the thermal load that the telescope is now experiencing around the whole of the assembly. And that goes on for a relatively short period of time. And then, of course, the telescope parts company from the launch vehicle. And this is an actual live shot from the camera on the front end of the upper stage of the Ariane 5 as the telescope leaves on its journey. Now, there's a couple of things about this. The first is, this is the last time we will actually see the telescope in a picture, in a, in a real picture. Secondly, um, I was very amused by a tweet that promptly appeared, which said, this is a very bad day for the flat earthers. So, <laughs> and off the telescope goes. Now, this, uh, sequence obviously goes on for some time and at this point there was starting to get a bit of consternation and I'll explain why now. But before I do that I just want to recap what I said to you the last time we did the presentation which is the basic design of the telescope. So looking at the cold side which is the cold side is the side that's obviously going to be pointing away from the sun 
the mirror itself, secondary mirror and so on and so forth, the instrument modules and so on and so forth are all on that side. If you go to the hot side, which is the side facing the sun, you obviously get the sun shields. As you can see, there's a thing called the momentum trim tab, which does help with alignment adjustments when you don't particularly want to use the thrusters. Uh, and of course, critically, the high gain antenna and also star trackers, which work out where the telescope is. Um, one other thing I would just want to draw your attention to is the solar panel. And the reason for that is this. Um, during the launch, there are quite a few uh, space nerds who follow the launch very closely on Twitter, particularly on Twitter. And they were beginning to get upset and the reason they were getting upset was that NASA had published the scheduled timeline for the launch. And what these nerds noticed was that the solar panel panels on the telescope were deployed earlier than they should have been according to the schedule. So this is what they were fretting about. Um, one of NASA's scientists who does a lot of answering of questions and so on, soon pointed out that in actual fact, the nerds hadn't read the whole manual because towards the end of the manual, it does say if the trajectory is optimal, it is possible to do some things earlier, earlier than was planned. And this was one of them. So in this image here, you can actually still see the telescope, but on the bottom left-hand corner, as it were, you can see the solar panel has already been deployed. This is, of course, is critical because that's where the telescope gets its power from. Uh, the telescope was already by now under the command of the Space Telescope Institute, which is at Baltimore in Maryland in the US. And it was taken over control even before the separation of the telescope from the Ariane launch vehicle. Now, the last time I spoke to you, I would have shown you this. Um, this was a NASA video about what was going to happen when the telescope unfolded. Telescope's mirror is far too big to get into a rocket so it had to be folded up. The uh, sun shield had to be folded up as well. And in fact, practically everything had to be folded up. So it all had to be unfolded. And you can see here the covers coming off the solar panels and then the solar panels being gradually ratcheted up. Once the covers are removed, there are five layers of the sun shield. Sorry, sun shield, I meant to say earlier. So there are five layers of that. And they get deployed, as you can see here. And you will see in just a later slide um, how the five uh, sun shield layers do their job. Then the secondary mirror, I mean, this is just a glorified telescope, basically. It's a Newtonian telescope. It's got a secondary mirror and a primary mirror. And so this just goes to show how the procedure takes place. Now, this was an extremely useful, extremely useful video at the time because it enabled us, we were running a thing called Astro Boost, which was to show young people how the telescope would work. And this was extremely useful. However, it is also misleading. And it completely misled me because when I watched the video, I assumed that this is how it would happen, that one thing would unfold after another and so on and so forth. And of course, it's not been like that at all because one of the things that concerned me was because this whole system seemed to be so automated, the chances of it not working seemed to be that much greater. 
But in fact, as I know now, and we all know, that wasn't how the deployment of the telescope took place. Just before we go to that, I just want to give you an overview of the reason for the sun shield. Now, this telescope is an infrared telescope. So it doesn't view uh, the universe in the visual light spectrum. It views it in the infrared. And one of the problems with that is the instruments used for processing data and so on have to be kept at very low temperatures because if they're not kept at very low temperatures they the noise thermal noise will overwhelm any data that you collect so that is the reason why you've got the sun shields now this is not the first infrared telescope there have been several previous ones including one the European Space Agency's Herschel, which was a much smaller telescope, which occupied the same orbit, a similar orbit to the one that this telescope is going to. It used coolant fluid to keep the temperature down. Big problem with that is you have to use something like really cold, like liquid helium. And of course, the big problem with that is eventually it boils off. So that telescope, for example, had a lifetime of about two years, because that was the limiting time that the coolant could still maintain the low temperature. This was not possible with this telescope because you would have required so much coolant. The design lifetime of the telescope is at least 10 years. So how on earth could you provide sufficient coolant? Well, you couldn't. So that was why the concept of the sun shield came into play. And as you can see here in the diagram, because of the different layers, the heat gets gradually trapped. So by the time you get to the top layer, you can see the outer layer, the temperature is minus 235 centigrade. So it is a temperature at which the telescope uh, instruments can operate okay. So that was the real reason for including this extremely complex sun shield. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the space time, the uh, space time, the space, in, the space telescope institute had taken over the control of the telescope right from the time it separated from the Ariane. And what I had not appreciated was that the deployment would take several weeks because it was under human control all the time. So it, it wasn't automated in the sense that the previous video I showed you gave the impression that it was. It wasn't like that at all. It was very tightly controlled. And it was tightly controlled from the place that you see here. The top um, room is the mission room where all the operations are carried out. The bottom picture on the right is the command center with just two people in it. And on the right hand side, this is the deployment of the fourth layer of the uh, sun shield. Now, this isn't an image from a camera. Uh, in fact, there were a number of questions soon after the launch about why they didn't have any cameras. And they carefully explained that it would require far too many cameras, and at least some of them would have to be on the cold side. And nobody in, in the world had developed a camera yet that could operate at those extremely low temperatures. So what they have instead is what's called a visualization tool. Now, what this tool does is it displays um, images built up from the telemetry, the data flow from the telescope. So basically, you are seeing in real time, seeing in inverted commas, how the telescope is looking at any particular point. One thing I found it, so here we are at the, they're 
The final stage is the deployment of the side segments of the primary mirror. Now, in this image from the visualization tool, one side has been deployed already. And this is the final part, which is the deployment of the final side segment into place. And I think you can also see behind how well the sun shield is already working. It is really darkening things up behind the telescope. So uh, you will be interested to know, I am sure, that the command language being used to carry out these operations is a version of C++ uh, enfolded in a JavaScript. So that is basically how the commands are processed. And we have something that you wouldn't have seen in the video, which was the command line is good, you may execute. And I'm going to come back to that with the next. So this is the deployment of of the final, let me just get to the right place. So we could have. Okay. Everyone's been working on this since the day of launch. Our launch deployments started uh, with our very first one that the, um, was caught by the rocket itself as it floated, JWST floated away from it, the upper stage. And it's been nonstop day after day since then, uh, having each deployment come along in series, everyone has gone very well. I see the system up and up, so I can confirm uh, safe and disabled, and we're ready to continue with 693.031. This is the step to actually do hey, the fire. command line looks good. This is for OTE LRM group H, and you are good to execute. Copy. To see you have to go to execute. Execute. And you're going to continue. Yes. Copy go to continue. Yes. You see how to go. There's a total of four mechanisms that do the launch lock. Uh, two are at the hinge where the, uh, which is actually closest to us in the display at, at the joints, one at the top, one at the bottom, and then two kind of hold the wing back to keep it from rattling during launch um, and are at the, at the far corners yeah, of the I can five and mirrors. You're going to arm. Copy all. Did he have to go to I can confirm armed, waiting for the stored command sequence enable. I think that's so amazing to me is that this what's happening today is the is the end of the, of 178 release mechanisms. You know, every single one had to work. Yeah, all stations, all stations are next go. It will fire um, OTE LRM group eight. OC, you are go to fire. Fire to see you have to go to fire. Yeah, this uh there was a lot of work to put into these. A lot of people have heard about our single point failures. Each one of these itself is a single point failure. In other words, if one of those four uh, launch releases does not release it, we're not able to move this uh, side of the mirror forward into position. Uh, so this would be our last of these four uh, single point failures. There's, there's still other single point failures and some, some that stay with us for the life of the mission uh, different areas of structure uh, or a, a mechanism that the mechanism fails we don't we don't have a, a second path of light to bring the light down but these are major milestones in getting the observatory into its final configuration for those of you who are joining us you're looking at live coverage of the uh, commissioning of the James Webb Space Telescope today we are unfolding the second of the wings of the primary mirrors Joining with me, joining me is Julie Van Kampen. She is the deputy commissioning engineer. You can see people there excited <laughs> and happy. <laughs> well, I'm copy. Thanks, Deputy. Lee. Glad to have the plot so we could follow along. You share your enthusiasm. That's awesome. 178 out of 178. Congratulations.
Uh, they just fired. It confirms that all of those and mechanisms just, fired. 178 of them. Over yeah, the course of the year. And we have to step up, sun up. I see that that um, rock has completed. We're ready to continue with 693.032 DEU to standby. Copy that. And they could see indications in the command tree. line. Looks good. You're good to execute. So I think um, that gives you a real flavor of what's been going on at the Space Telescope Institute. Um, they don't, they have, they did work shifts earlier on, but they tend to just work the day and then have a break, have an overnight break, because this has been a very long and very intense operation. My favorite dialogue from the whole thing is uh, the command line is good, you may execute, which is, you know, gives a, a little bit of comfort when you're in the process of doing the job. Um, the, uh, the, the, just a, an example of schedules, the, the, the deployment of the five layers of the sunshade were supposed to be taken one day at a time. However, when they did the first one, they found it so straightforward that they then decided to do the second one immediately after. And that was also very straightforward. So they went for a third one. Now, at that point, they were, you know, all wound up to do a fourth one, but the, the, the mission commander did point out that they all needed a good night's sleep and it would be better off if they did four and five the next morning. So that is what they did. So we now have reached a point um, after launch where the telescope is at its final location. It's at the L2 Lagrange point, as you can see here. There are a number of Lagrange points. Uh, these are not orbits around the Earth. They are separate orbits around the Sun. And one of the reasons why this particular one was chosen is it's a very stable orbit. And so the station keeping that the telescope will require to keep it on track is at a minimum. Um, you can see it's quite some distance from the Earth. So there's no way of fixing anything if it were to go wrong. But this just gives you some idea of where the orbit is and it will remain in that orbit for its whole lifetime. Uh, speaking of lifetime, you remember, and this seems quite a long time ago, early in the long sequence, I drew your attention to the uh, theoretical trajectory as against the actual one and how close they were to each other. But it turned out that they were super close. In fact, they were so close that the uh, space telescope was able to get into orbit, into its orbit, and so on and so forth, with less utilization of its own thrusters than it would normally have had to do. So hardly any at all. Now, what that means is the thrusters are one of the main ways of keeping the telescope on station. And this is where you get the design lifetime of 10 years from. But because of the extreme accuracy of the Ariane 5 guidance system, it now turns out that this lifetime can be, it looks as if it's going to be extended by several years, purely because of the accuracy of the launch. So um, it's quite difficult to visualize the mirror itself, and it doesn't look like an ordinary telescope mirror for two reasons. First of all, it's hexagonal shape. And secondly, the fact that it is segmented. Now, the second point is not unusual. Many telescopes in the world, the big telescopes that is, are segmented. Uh, one of the reasons for segmentation is if you segment a telescope, you can put little uh, control mechanisms, computer controlled control mechanisms behind each segment. And with that, you can use what's called adaptive optics. And what adaptive optics does with 
really big uh, Earth-based telescopes, such as European Southern Observatory's X very large telescope, and it is actually called that, BWT, very large telescope. Um, the actuators change the shape of the whole mirror slightly so that atmospheric turbulence can be minimized during the viewing of anything that the telescope is pointing at. So now these uh, segments aren't going to be used for that so much. They are going to be used to fine tune the telescope so that all the segments come to the same focus at the same time. Uh, and there is actually a map of the segments, as you can see here. There are three different kinds of segments, and this depends on where they are on the telescope. And the reason for this is they are made of slightly different specifications to each other to account for the fact that they may be on the edge or the thermal loading might be slightly different. So it's a complex system, as you can see. But the other thing about this is, um, I mentioned actuators, and behind the telescope mirror, there is literally a whole cage which contains actuators like this. And these are the actuators that just slightly deform each segment so they can all be tuned in together over a period of time. And that's a process that has just been completed. So just to recap on what the science goals are, because using uh, the infrared spectrum, the telescope can look back so far to not that far from the Big Bang. Um, it can, should be able to see the earliest stars and galaxies. And from that, of course, if you time slice that coming back in time, you can actually track the evolution of galaxies. You can also study star and planet formation. And finally, because the telescope is so powerful, I was just reading yesterday that there are now over 4,600 exoplanets that have been discovered. Exoplanets are planets that are orbiting other stars, not our star. And there's a huge number of them. And we've only looked really at a small section of the night sky in our own galaxy in, in search for those. Um, the tele this telescope is so powerful that it may well be possible to detect atmospheric structures um, in some exoplanet atmospheres. And if that were to be the case, of course, we would then start looking and asking questions about what well, is this atmosphere capable of supporting some form of life? So that's a primary goal. Um, of course, no telescope is any good without its instruments. The reason I brought in this one, which is MIRI, which is mid-infrared, is that it was constructed in Europe, uh, partly at the Cullum Laboratory and the Royal Edinburgh Observatory. So we've got a particular interest in this instrument. A critical instrument is, of course, near CAM, which is this one. So this is the one that has all the um, lenses, as it were. This is the one with the uh, cameras, and this is the one which operates um, to detect whatever is being detected. Um, and finally, we've got the rather splendidly named these are not the only instruments, but this is the um, slitless spectrograph, and this is the one that's got a lot of filters with it. And as you can see here, these instruments are somewhat complicated in their own right. Now, one of the things that's been happening over the last month is that the instruments have been cooling down because the sunshades have been working fine. The temperature has been dropping steadily and just about a week or so ago it was got cold enough for the instruments to be switched on or at least two of them to be switched on including near cam which is the camera instrument 
And the reason I mentioned that is that last week, this happened. No, last week this didn't happen, but this is what would happen as a result of that. This is the returning of the data. So critical that the data gets sent back to Earth for processing. And this is a, a screenshot of the deep space network now. You can go onto it live, and if you go onto it live, it shows you which telescopes are currently operating and what they're mainly looking at. And this is absolutely critical. And again, last week, the uh, main antennae, antenna on the telescope was deployed and made contact with the deep space network. And so we're up to full speed on transfer rates. So that's another plus uh, that's happened. So this, um, I don't, there aren't going to be any questions on this, but this is basically the light path uh, of the telescope when the light comes into the tube and then gets moved around, shifted and reflected backwards and forwards, as you can see, and so on and so forth. Now, clearly, all this has got to function properly before anything can be detected. And last week, the first photons coming through the tube were detected. So this shows that the entire system is operating as designed. Now, of course, because of all the expectations, because of the launch and everything else built up, I think a lot of people will be expecting this kind of thing. This is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope, and this is the Pillars of Creation. It's a very famous image, iconic image. And of course, it, obviously it's been processed a lot, but it's a visual spectrum image. And so people, you know, the um, Hubble has published thousands of images of galaxies and star systems and so on. And they're all recognizable because they're all in the visual spectrum. Now, remember, the James Webb Telescope does not operate in the visual spectrum. It operates in the infrared. So the first images that will be released, the first um, you know, uh, public images, won't look anything like this. So if you were expecting them to look like this, it's going to be a problem. Well, it would be a problem apart from this. Uh, you. There's no doubt that you can learn from past experiences. Now, this was the European Space Agency Giotto mission, which was sent to Halley's Comet in 1986. <coughs> Excuse me. And it got close to Halley's Comet, and it took a lot of images of it. Unfortunately, None of the people, uh, well, very few of the people operating Giotto were aware of the impact of publishing images from it. And the first images published from the Giotto were not what people expected. And this was one of the first ones. Now, I want you to picture the scene. It's, the, it's, um, it's the Royal Astronomical Society evening soiree at the time that this image was published. You know, drinkies, canapes, and so on. And there were big screens waiting for the first image. Um, among the invited guests was the then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. When this first image appeared, she took one look at it and she said, to think I've wasted 30 million pounds on this. So as you can see, management of expectations is extremely important. <laughs> so it will come as no surprise for any of you to hear, that NASA has a team for managing expectations. And one of the things they will do when the first images are published, they will be published side by side 
with Hubble images of the same um, star or galaxy, or whatever it is. And so the two will fit together sit side by side. So it'll be a lot easier to explain the one from the other. So I think now what I would suggest is I'm going to stop the share. So if anybody has got any questions at the moment that they want to unmute and ask rather than sending them by chat, I'll be very happy with that. Okay. So thank you all very much. I'm still a little in awe at the moment. There's a lot going on there. Yeah. Hey, I quick, yeah, I had a quick question. Hello. Um, thank you so much for that, Roger. It was really, really insightful. Um, uh, quick question around your thoughts around the uh, what do you expect to see um, in the next few months once the images come back? Um, I, I'm sort of talking with regards to uh, where they had the Ignatius Forum in November of last year around our future in space, where um, specifically Bill, Bill Nelson, um, administrator of NSA, um, Abel Haynes, Abby Loeb, mm. um, mentioned a few bits and pieces. And what your expectations are around well, what, um, what, what, what's coming? Well, the thing you, I mean, the thing you've got to remember is I'm in a slightly unfair situation because I've seen a lot of infrared images. So I'm reasonably familiar with them. Now, having said that, you know the image I showed you of the pillars of creation, the Hubble one? Yes, yes. There exists an infrared version of that. And once it's been explained to you slightly, there's a lot of stuff there. Because the thing about the infrared is it looks, it goes straight through the dust clouds. So the dust clouds don't obscure anything. I mean, famously, astronomers used to think that dust clouds were just a damn nuisance, you know, they got in the way of things. Of course, what we now know is that dust clouds are absolutely critical because that's where new stars are born in, in these dust clouds, you know. And so I would expect that in terms of first images released, they will be quite like that. They will be images of objects that are recognizable. You've got to remember that this is a publicly funded telescope. I mean, okay, it's American taxpayer who's funded most of it, but NASA are very conscious of the fact that they've got to have something that they can show to people without cheating, as it were, you know. It would be very easy to cheat, you know. And people are so used to that these days with all kinds of manipulations and videos and so on, but they're obviously not going to do that. But what I think you will see is an object, you know, like um, like the pinwheel galaxy, for example. I mean, I've seen that in infrared as well. You'll first see it in visual, and then it will gradually fade into the image in infrared. And because it will gradually fade, you'll be able to pick up if, with suitable commentary what's going on. You know, why is it that it doesn't look the same as it does? With the visual images and hopefully it won't take too long for people to get used to this i mean after all fair play on human beings we've never seen anything in the infrared until very recently you know we, we're limited by our side yeah of course <laughs> give us a break you know <laughs> it is something that definitely is going to take getting used to but the plus side is you get so much more information and yes. so um, the other thing is they have already released the source of the first star that they're going to look at. Uh, and this is an insignificant star, about 25 light years away from us. And the reason they're chosen that one is um, it's too bright for infrared, but it's how they're focusing the telescope. So individual segments and so on, they get gradually focused by looking at this particular image and just before it gets too bright it'll be obviously switched to somewhere else uh, 
The rumor is, of course, there's a short list of nice objects which are going to be the first to be published. But as you can imagine, this is jealously guarded, although I'm not sure it's going to be jealously guarded enough. You know, <laughs> but that's how they're hoping to do it. I mean, fair play to the Space Telescope Institute. They've got a lot of practice because they've been managing the Hubble for years. Yeah. They're used to managing the Space Telescope. They're a very impressive outfit. Um, it's not a kind of place where you can just go along and get a job, you know, but they are extremely good at their job. And as my wife was saying, she was watching part of it. She said, there's no air of panic, is there? You know, it's all very calm. So you can't do it any other way, you know, especially not if you're using C++ to issue commands. You, it's really difficult to panic then, you know. So does that help? Yes, definitely. Yeah, good. Anyone else? Thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. Thanks, Ian. That was yeah, question. Um, I was. Oh, sorry, Andy. Go no, on. I was going to say I've, I've just got a very quick question, if that's okay. First of all, thanks a lot, Roger. That was really, really good. That um, learnt lots. And um, uh, Christmas Day was very interesting watching the launch. And okay. uh, yeah, we did we did put some time aside to watch the launch. Um, just a quick question about the instrumentation that's on. James Webb Space Telescope. Will any of it be any good for shedding any light on Tabby's star? Is that something that's possible at all? I think Tabby's star will be one of the um, exoplanet targets, certainly. Right. And the answer is yes, because as I'm sure you're aware, Tabby's star has some very strange orbitals on its planets, you know, yeah. uh, people have been scratching their heads about this. There appears to be some kind of relationship between them, um, some kind of harmonic distribution or whatever. Yeah. So uh, yeah, from that point of view, Tabby Star is an extremely interesting target. And I cannot imagine it would be anything other than an early target when they mm -hmm. start. See, one of the things is, which of the objectives are they going to go for first? Mm. So, are they going to try looking right back towards the Big Bang? I don't think so. I think because they are, let's face it, a publicity aware organization, I think it will be very tempting to look at exoplanets very early on. Mm. And mm. they've got a long list of exoplanets to look at. And because the telescope is so much more powerful than any then the Kepler, for example, which was has logged up an amazing number of exoplanets, but not in any detail. See, one of the biggest problems is, as, you, as, I'm, as you're probably aware, is a lot of the detection of exoplanets uses what's called the transit method. Yeah. So the planet crosses the star and there's a dip in the light intensity, mm. goes back up. But that's all it is. You know, that's all you can see, really. But with the Webb telescope, you should be able to find that, tune that to such an extent, you can even measure if there's an atmosphere before right. the main body, the planet appears. And within that, you might well be able to analyze the atmosphere itself. And of course, one of the things they are going to be looking for are biological markers, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So I would imagine exoplanets are very high on the list. And because Tabby Star has got so much publicity already, I would thought it'll be quite high on the list as well. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Fingers crossed, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, we haven't had to cross fingers so far, so. <laughs> I'm sure there was many crossed fingers somewhere on Christmas Day. Oh, there were. It there wasn't were. in the control room. <laughs> just at Dr. Becky's place as well. I yeah. mean, if anyone has ever seen her Twitter feed, it's hilarious. Dr. Beckett, did you say what was her first name? Her name is, is Becky Smethurst. And she has a Twitter feed called Dr. Becky, which is very popular, actually. She's a very good communicator. She, she's, um, as I said, she's a, uh, a postdoc. Um, she works on, she won an award quite recently. She works on galaxy, uh, black holes the development of black holes and so on. And her supervisor is Chris Lintoff, who you may recognize if you've ever watched The Star at Night. 
star you know he's one of the co he's one of the two co-presenters he's the non-excitable one uh, <laughs> and he is the co-presenter of that and he's her supervisor so she's very well regarded in the field but she's also very entertaining as well so if you, if you get a chance sometime it's well worth a look because she cannot stop pacing around her kitchen <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. I don't blame her. Um, one of the questions I was going to ask is I seem to remember uh, reading somewhere uh, a, a, about the calibration process and how they're going to keep that, basically the photos that are coming from that calibration process, they're yeah. keeping them under wraps and they've got to basically wait while, while, it, while it calibrates. So how long is, is that process? Well, um, oh, you mean... Once an image has been taken, the post processing. Uh, oh, how long? How long? How long is it going to be calibrating for? Sorry, that's a very good question, which I don't actually know the answer to, but I would imagine it would be two or three days. Okay. Uh, I mean, they do have um, quite s significant computational power at their um, a bit more than my laptop or. <laughs> And I don't, there'll be so much pressure on them to actually, of course, the only thing is you've got to get it right. I mean, famously, the first images that were sent back from the surface of Mars way back in 1978 by the Viking lander got the colour wrong. <laughs> they thought that the sky would be some kind of pale blue, and of course it's not, it's pink. So the interpret, you know, they process the images and they said, okay, color contrast so-and-so, and they ended up with what was a pink sky, a slightly pink sky, uh, sorry, a slightly blue sky, and immediately quite a few people say, well, is that right? I mean, there's a lot of dust on Mars. <laughs> Why does the sky look like that? And they soon realized their error. So, I mean, that was, again, another lesson. So you've got to be really careful. The, the actual telescope itself, once it is aligned and fully calibrated in terms of focusing, they don't need to change that at all. Um, somebody on the NASA Twitter feed asked a very good question, which was, what happens if one of the segments is hit by a micrometeorite? And the answer to that is, it depends how seriously it's hit. If it's not a big hole, you know, it's not a problem. But what they can do, because they've got so many other segments, they can detune that one, uh -huh. out of the cluster, and then retune the other slightly to ignore the fact it was over there. Uh -huh. yeah. They didn't say how many of these they could do. <laughs> what you've got to remember is, I showed you the image of the orbit, it's facing away from the sun. Um, and it, L2 is not only highly stable, but there's not a lot of space rock or dust around there either. So it's a very well chosen um, location from those points of view, you know. So fingers crossed, there won't be too many micro meteorites wandering down the tube, you know, to the telescope. Fingers crossed indeed. Fingers crossed indeed. Well, I'm quickly checking the YouTubes for some questions and we haven't had any through. So I'm going to hit the end stream button. So okay. come back out of the uh, out of the yeah. shadows. Yeah. Uh, but yes, thank you again. Uh, I guess on the YouTube version of thank you. But uh, yeah. Um, but those questions, of course, if you do have any questions in the future, I'm sure Roger will uh, I'm happy to receive my emails. Foolishly. <laughs> I might suggest that when the first real images start coming back, we might do another session then. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. You can you can explain all of the infrared photos to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are neat ways of doing that. So okay. Ross, yeah. a couple of those would work, yes. So yeah, thank you fun. so much indeed for listening to me tonight. Yeah, no, yeah thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank right, you, the YouTube. Thank you, Sean. Yes. Yeah. YouTube. Cheers now. Bye. Oh. Oh. Bye. Take care.